Hello and welcome to Connected. I'm Divya Gopalan. Take a good look at these animals. This is the northern white rhino, a subspecies of the second largest land mammal, the white rhino from East and Central Africa. Here's an ivory-billed woodpecker, one of the largest woodpeckers in the world from North America. And this is a baijiton, or Chinese river dolphin, a species from China's Yangtze River. You won't be able to see any of them alive anymore. They became extinct or functionally extinct in just the past few years. In fact, the last known ivory-billed woodpecker died just last year, along with six other species. So today, we want to talk about what we can do and what we should stop doing to keep our diverse and beautiful wildlife thriving. Our guest is renowned for his conservation efforts worldwide. Peter Knight, the CEO and co-founder of Wild Africa Fund. Thank you for joining us from Lafayette, California. It is great to have you on this program. Um, I'm going to start with your previous work. You were the co-founder of Wild Aid, which was revolutionary in its push for conservation by stopping consumption and lobbying governments. What's the approach of Wild Africa Fund now? Well, Wild Africa Fund is really using the same kind of techniques, uh, mass communication, to get public and political will to protect endangered species, just focusing on Africa. Uh, as you mentioned, a lot of my work previously uh, was in Asia, um, looking at the demand for, for rhino horn, elephant ivory, and shark fin. Um, we're now working on the demand for illegal bushmeat in Africa, but we're also just trying to get more people in Africa engaged in conservation and supporting conservation. Now, um, going back to rhinos, we saw the picture of the northern white rhino in the beginning. Um, along with the western black rhino, it's become extinct in the wild. Can you explain what this demand for rhino, or what's fueling this demand for rhinos? Well, the demand for rhino horn, um, you know, people say it's a huge demand. It's actually a relatively small number of individuals that are involved in consuming rhino horn around the world. But obviously, there's very few rhinos left. And it's been, you know, that demand has been catastrophic for rhinos. There's plenty of rhino habitat left. For most endangered species, habitat is a major issue. For rhinos, there's plenty of habitat left. Um, but it's just the poaching for the horn, which is used, uh, was used in traditional medicine. Um, and then about 2008, uh, people in Vietnam suddenly started spreading rumors that it could cure cancer. And that caused a new spike in rhino poaching because up to about 2006, rhino poaching was down to only a very few individuals. And it looked like maybe we'd won the battle to save the rhinos. But then this new demand came driven from Vietnam. Uh, and even rhino horn being used um, to cure hangovers uh, and then for claiming to cure cancer, which, of course, it's keratin. It's like your fingernails or your hair. It's not going to cure cancer. So would you say it is these kinds of um, narratives or rumors that that's kind of spiking the consumption and the demand for trade, not just in rhino horns, but fueling poachers and keeping them in business? Well, obviously, you know, if people don't pay high prices for these uh, animal parts, then people are not going to go and poach them. They don't do it for fun. They do it for money. And, and key is reducing those prices. And in recent years, we've had quite a lot of success in driving down the price of rhino horn. It's about 25% uh, of what it was um, previously. Uh, same with ivory. It's about 60%, 70% of what it was previously. So we've managed to push the price down. But unfortunately, there's still a few individuals uh, who really don't care, unfortunately, um, and will go out and buy these products, see them as prestigious, uh, and also just want to speculate and make money. I've just literally today received a I don't know if you can see this, but some of Facebook posting. I'm going to try and hold this up to the camera. If you can see that, let me. Just, that is 20, 20 rhino horns on sale in, in Taiwan uh, on, on social media. And so there's still a market left for these products. And governments have got a little bit better at enforcing this, but it's really up to the public to report that and also just tell people it's not acceptable to basically invest in the, in the extinction of the rhino. You mentioned Taiwan. Can you tell us Taiwan's role in this? I understand uh, not long ago you were here doing some work in Taiwan and trying to stop some of this trafficking. Can you explain what, where Taiwan lies in the bigger picture? Well, it's quite a time ago now. I have to date myself now, but it was in the 90s. And uh, at that time, um, we did have uh, Taiwan was the number one consumer of rhino horn. Um, we had some very successful campaigns uh, and the government started cracking down. And I was glad to say for a long time, it seemed like the market in Taiwan was basically stopped. Um, however, it does look like the signs now. It may be 
coming back again. So unfortunately, you know, these battles, you never sort of win them. You, you kind of have temporary victories uh, and your losses, of course, are permanent. So, um, you know, we have to keep the education, keep the awareness. And the key to me is, is making it socially un unacceptable to consume these products. So I did have one rhino horn trader in, uh, in Taiwan back in the day say to me, well, my grandson called me Rhino Terminator and said, I'm destroying the rhinos. And I said, well, it, it, it's, it's their future you're destroying. It's their future you're taking away. Right. Yeah, what point you made about bringing prices down, how does that work, especially when, as we're saying, the, the resource is depleting, so therefore supply is depleting, but demand is still high. How do you bring prices down? Uh, education, uh, awareness, you know, as you know, the campaigns we ran at Wade with Jackie Chan, Yao Ming, uh, over 200 very famous, Jay Chow, very famous people backing these campaigns and supporting them and educating people and make people understand that by purchasing them, they really may as well be, you know, pulling the trigger themselves. And so a lot of it is about that education and awareness. Um, and then, you know, the governments have uh, come up to speed. Back in the 90s, uh, all kinds of stuff was going on. Now most governments take this very seriously and are trying to do their part to help. So we, we made a lot of progress. And in fact, with the rhinos, um, you know, at the, the, back then they would have gone extinct in five or 10 years on the current trends. Uh, and they've actually, you know, stabilized now. The black rhinos actually started to come back a bit, which is fantastic. Um, so, you know, there's been some progress, but the battle's not over. You spoke about Ivory, and that's, that's been, I would say, one of the most successful or pro probably renowned campaigns is the ban on ivory with governments being involved in this too. Um, where do you see the ivory trade now and has, have people stopped uh, wanting to buy ivory? Has it been, become enough of a stigma where it's not even considered as something that's valuable? Well, for a lot of people, yes. Uh, and, you know, the market within mainland China in particular has really declined. And I have to give credit to Chinese customs. They've done a really good job uh, on enforcing that law. However, what we've seen as a trend is that sometimes Chinese people going abroad to places like Vietnam, um, you know, Laos and places like that are purchasing their ivory abroad, uh, abroad where basically law enforcement is not so good. These products are openly on sale. So it's better than it was, but it's still a major problem. And particularly for the forest elephants, um, forest elephants, uh, there's way less of them and they still are poached in, in large numbers. But as well as the demand, there's also problems on the ground, such as corruption, uh, lack of uh, resources for enforcement, weak laws um, and uh, and poor prosecutions. And so that's something we're working on. at Wild Africa Fund is working with the governments to encourage, you know, those sort of prosecutions. So, for example, in Nigeria, where we're working, they just had their first successful prosecution in 20 years on ivory and, and, and uh, pangolin scale smuggling. And so, you know, it takes political will. It takes um, public pressure in order to get those agencies working. But we're seeing signs that, you know, it's starting to get better. Yeah. So pangolins are one of the most trafficked mammals in the world. Can you explain why what, what's you know, why people want pangolins and what's being done to, tr and to try and stop the trade? Yeah, one of the things about pangolins is that they don't really breed in captivity. So even the top zoos have a really hard time breeding in captivity. So our wild population is really all we have. Um, and they've been targeted mainly for their scales, which again is keratin. It's used in traditional medicine, but there's alternatives in traditional medicine. You don't have to have pangolins. And then it's also the bushmeat trade. So people are actually eating pangolins, um, even though there's not much meat on them. Uh, and so, you know, that that's something we're fighting against. And the the uh, the other aspect of that is, of course, zoonotic disease, disease transmission. And in the early days of COVID, um, they found COVID viruses, similar COVID viruses in pangolins. Um, and, you know, some of the dishes involved with pangolins involve raw blood. So if you want to spread disease, there's probably a better, not a better way to do it than that. It looks like it's probably these uh, raccoon dogs now as, as the transmitter of COVID, but it could have definitely been pangolins. And so public education, again, is important. Um, you know, we've uh, people don't realize they breed very slowly, maybe only have one baby every 18 months to two years. Um, so their capacity to absorb any kind of trade is very, very low. So, again, it's education, it's awareness um, and people moving on to alternatives in medicine uh, and the same in cuisine. You don't have to eat a pangolin. Uh, Africa is one of the continents uh, where a lot of these pangolins and a lot of the, um, uh, the these wild animals come from and are trafficked from. Can you explain the focus on that continent? You are now with the Wild Africa Fund. Why Africa? 
Well, to be honest, it's the only continent really that's got significant quantities of large animals left. And if you look at the history of the rhino horn trade, there were rhinos all over Asia. They became very, very endangered. Uh, pangolins, again, the, the Asian pangolins are highly, highly endangered. So these populations were local and then they were wiped out. And so now it's switched to Africa. So it's the source for a lot of these animals. But at the same time, it's the only place where, you know, you have large numbers of elephants and a lot of these other animals. The good news is that um, you know, when uh, Asia wiped out its large animals, when Europe wiped out its large animals, the United States wiped out its large animals, there wasn't really a financial benefit from keeping the animals. The only profit could be made from trade. And the good thing in Africa is tourism is obviously a huge industry there. For many countries, it's the primary industry in the country. Places like Kenya and South Africa, it provides millions of jobs. And people have calculated, for example, that a live elephant can generate a million dollars over its lifetime in tourism revenue. So there's a sound economic argument for keeping these animals, never mind the sentimentality about it's wrong to make them extinct. There's actually hard economic support for maintaining these animals going into the future. Right. And if I want to take it to the oceans, one of the other successful campaigns has been the ban of the shark fin trade or as much as possible. Can you tell us where we're at with that and why there's still a demand for shark fin? Yeah, I mean, shark fin, there's still a long way to go on that one, too, unfortunately. And a number of species have been put, um, you know, on the endangered list. But unfortunately, shark fin's quite hard to identify by species. So there's a lot of trade still going on that's unsustainable. But we did manage to reduce the imports of shark fin to China by uh, 83% through public awareness uh, and with the support of the government and the, and, and the media. Um, but the laws still need to catch up. There's still a lot of shark finning going on. Um, there's still a lot of sharks in danger. They think there's about 10% of the world's sharks left now. And they re again, they reproduce very slowly. So again, it's still on the cusp. Um, they get caught in other fisheries and they also get targeted. And of course, they still get finned where the fins are chopped off and the animal thrown overboard. So again, there's still a long way to go on that, but we have made some progress. Um, and another big important factor for that is setting up a more marine reserves around the world. Uh, and there are some global goals of, um, you know, getting 30% of the oceans protected by 2030. We're, we're a long ways off that. And first of all, you have to get them legally protected and then you actually have to enforce it. So, again, it's still a long way to go on this journey if we're going to save the world's sharks and, and the oceans. Yeah, one of the places, I mean, this region in particular is one of the places where should, there still is that demand in shark fin and it's seen as a luxury item and a part, way to entertain people. Although, you know, if you ask people around here, not many people like the taste of shark fin. So if there's a reason you want to give them to care about the depleting population of sharks, what would it be? Well, there's multiple reasons. You know, there's the endangered sharks that have been around here for literally hundreds of millions of years. You know, they are a keystone species maintaining the ecosystems. Um, they reproduce very slowly. Um, they also have a lot of mercury in them. For anyone that wants to consume shark fin, shark fin has high levels of mercury in it. Um, and, you know, it, it has no flavor. Um, the flavor all comes from the soup itself. It's purely texture. Um, so it, it's completely unnecessary. And there are a lot of other ways to honor your guests, you know, buy them a nice bottle of wine, have some other fancy dish. It doesn't have to have shark fin in it. And I'm told that there's actually a substitute shark fin, which is basically a noodle, which tastes, it has the same taste, obviously, it's the fl there's no flavor there, but it has the same texture as shark fin. So there are all alternatives that you can have and enjoy the soup, honor the tradition, but don't kill the shark. So if you had to name and shame the top countries that are culprits in the wildlife trade, who would they be? Well, that's a tough question, depending on what kind of wildlife trade. Because even here in the United States, we have very good law enforcement and good laws, but we still have trafficking of reptiles, for example, live reptiles. And then if you look at China, again, they've made massive advances. Obviously, it's a huge country. And so, you know, there's a lot of demand there and there's a lot of people that haven't quite got the message yet. Um, but they have made huge advances in the law enforcement and the public education. Uh, and then, you know, Vietnam was awful a few years ago. It's got a little bit better. It's still a major hub for trafficking. Nigeria, where we're working, has been, you know, the largest transit point for ivory and pangolin scales. We're trying to get new laws through working with the government there. We're trying to get better enforcement, um, but they're, they're in a pretty bad position. But, you know, nobody's holier than now in this game. There's, every country has some issues uh, and everybody has to work together if we're going to have some solutions. And there's that fine balance between economy and preserving nature. And one of the things that you're, you, you do is lobby governments. What are the biggest challenges in lobbying governments to be able to take into account the importance of nature when they're trying to grow their economy or create livelihoods for people? 
we don't really lobby. We try and make them aware and we try and basically, um, you know, have the people of the country rather than us coming in outside saying it, you know, letting them voice their opinions. But it, it's a tension, right? There's a million issues on every government's agenda. Uh, and this is not necessarily number one. Uh, and it's about ensuring that, you know, they have the right information and they try and make the right decisions. And they realize, you know, a lot of our work now is, is uh, telling people about the value that can be derived in the industry that's coming from wildlife. We're doing some work in Rwanda, for example, with the gorillas. And, you know, the gorillas is one of the top earners in the country of foreign currency, just people going to see the gorillas every day. So it's education and awareness, and then it's getting it to the list of priorities. And, you know, um, it, it's always a challenge because there's so much else going on, but that's why we need uh, the media and we need the public on board and we need prominent people. Just as we work with Jackie Chan and Yao Ming and Jay Chow in Asia, we're working with the same kind of icons um, in Africa. We're doing a big campaign with musicians, over 120 musicians who've done concerts, which we put wildlife information in the middle of those concerts to educate people and reach young people. So it's about awareness uh, and that awareness has to go across the board, not just the politicians, but also the public. Would you say there's a gener generational awareness? You gave the example of the grandfather earlier, and, and you're now talking about campaigns to reach young people. But in essence, it is the older generation that can control a lot of our resources. So how does that work? Well, you want to do both because, you know, we found a number of cases where young people have influenced older people. And, and ultimately, most things on this planet, my, my grand old age, you know, they'll be around while I'm still around. But my kids and my grandchildren will be the ones that are really going to suffer and pay the costs of our negligence, frankly. And it doesn't matter if it's on climate change, uh, on plastics, or any of these big environmental issues, we really have been somewhat asleep at the wheel. And, and the, really, the, the problems are really gonna hit the next generation going forward rather than ourselves. So, you know, you wanna have uh, the young people on board, but you can't just talk to the young people because it's gonna be too late. But hopefully young people will rally around and push their cases. You know, it's literally their future we're squandering. There are some examples of reviving certain species or bringing them back from the brink of extinction. Could you, could you name some examples or talk us through some successful operations in recent times? No, absolutely. And, and you know, the rhinos there, the northern whites, of course, is very sad. There's only two individuals left. But the southern white rhino, uh, there's about 16,000 now. In the 1960s, there was about 50 of them left. And it really looked like they would go extinct. And they've been brought all the way back there. So. If we can find protection for animals, we, they can come back. We can recreate ecosystems. Nature is pretty robust if we give it a chance. So, you know, although there's so many doom and gloom stories, I mean, we just had the California condor. You may not have heard this, but they just got um, uh, avian flu here and they'd been nurturing this population, hand rearing them back in, you know, a few dozen of these animals. And then they got avian flu. Of course, that's another another problem we have disease and, and increased disease transmission and things like that. But um, it, there have been a lot of success stories, too, along the way, uh, re rebuilding habitats, uh, repopulating uh, populations of, of different animals. It, it's, do it's totally doable if there's the political will um, to preserve the land and to stop the poaching. I want to go back to this idea of kind of living with uh, with wildlife and actually helping wildlife thrive while thriving yourself. And you, one of one of the major campaigns for wildlife Africa, I believe, is uh, the Africa Fund. Is believe I believe is tourism. Is that right? Um, and you did touch on this. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, I mean, if people want to help wildlife in Africa. Go to Africa, <laughs> you know, have, go on a safari because that money goes directly to that economy and it encourages the governments to do the conservation. And so, you know, um, as well as uh, getting people to come from abroad, which obviously puts money in there, we're also trying to encourage more Africans to visit their own national parks because there is a, a growing middle class now that can totally afford to do it. And it doesn't usually occur to them, um, you know, to go to, uh, to their own parks. And so we've been taking uh, famous people to see the parks and their experiences. And every single person I've taken, um, you know, hasn't visited these parks themselves in their own country. And when they do, they love it and they want to take their family and they're completely sold. So encouraging people to get out into nature, encouraging them to see for themselves uh, is, is part of what we're doing there. And uh, we, for example, the first lady of Zimbabwe, uh, we took her out to visit um, some parks and meet an elephant she'd never done before. I was tremendously excited by it, opened her eyes and became way engaged in these issues and wants to really be an advocate for helping try to solve the human wildlife conflict and all the different issues. 
So, you know, it, it is really a life changing experience to go to Africa and see these animals and also meet the people. The people are amazing. The people are wonderful. They're protecting these animals. And so I would encourage people, um, you know, to, if they have that opportunity, please go and do it. It's, you won't regret it. It's an amazing thing. And at the same time, you are helping uh, to protect the wildlife. Right, you won't see that kind of magnificent grand wildlife here in Taiwan, but here's a reason to visit. Taiwan's unique biodiversity has made it home to several endemic species. That means they're only found here. And this report by Sylvan Paul tells us the story of a former British diplomat who has a number of species named after him, and it's presented through the eyes of one of the country's foremost wildlife filmmakers. Take a look. Liu Yaming has spent the past four decades capturing life, both big and small, from behind the lens. The 72-year-old is considered the father of Taiwan's wildlife filmmaking. But as he trained the lens more on his homeland, the country's unique biodiversity and abundant wildlife started to emerge. His first films focused on Taiwanese macaques, also known as the Formosan rock monkeys and blue magpies. They were discovered in the 19th century by the British diplomat Robert Swinho, the first European consular representative to Taiwan. But more than his diplomatic assignments, he is remembered for his conservation contributions to Taiwan's wildlife. Mm, 所以我鳥類它命名的大半都有排過。The The statue of Suino, located inside the old British consulate in South Taiwan's Kaohsiung city, displays some of his discoveries. This bird, donning the red, white and blue color of Taiwan's national flag, is often called the unofficial national symbol of Taiwan. It's called Suino's pheasant. He is an amazing guy, not just for birds, but also for wildlife in general. I think that he described about described or identified around 227 bird species, 40 mammals, and then countless other things such as, you know, terrestrial snails, freshwater animal, you know, plants, insects. He was there and he did so much for Taiwan's uh, natural history and recording. Scott Persner is monitoring the diverse bird population in Ta'an Forest Park right in the middle of Taipei. His organization, the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation, is the biggest wild bird conservation group in the country. Oh, well, actually, one species which Swin Ho did uh, describe for Taiwan that became famous because of its conservation situation, particularly involving Taiwan, is the black-faced spoonbill. Because the black-faced spoonbill is an endangered water bird species. It's endemic to East Asia, and he described it in the, in the 1860s. And actually, it was in the late 1980s, around 1988, 1989, that people realized, thanks to a study done by people in Hong Kong, that uh, the bird was critically endangered, that there were less than 300 of them in the world. However, Taiwan had o over 150 of that population. While Taiwan's conservation efforts did save the black-faced spoonbill, another animal first described by Suinho in 1873 is on the verge of extinction. The Yangtze giant soft-shell turtle goes by the scientific name of Rafeta Swinhui after the English biologist. Only two male members of the world's largest freshwater turtle are known to exist now after their female counterpart was found dead in Vietnam in April this year. The species is one that Liu Yaming has yet to capture but may never get the chance to. Well, a reminder that all creatures have a place on the planet and as our diversity shrinks on a daily basis, more needs to be done to ensure that the wildlife we see doesn't just live on in these images. With Yunnan Chow and Wesley Ostrizen, Shubhampal connected.
Peter, we're coming to the end of the show, but I do like to leave our viewers with a thought, or in this case, a call to action. Can you give us some words of inspiration or encouragement to help us push harder to protect our wildlife? Well, I think, you know, the, the rarest commodity we're aware of in the universe is life, right? We haven't yet found it anywhere else. And we live in this incredible, the beautiful images there, but the incredible diversity on this planet. We're so blessed. We're so lucky. Uh, and, we, and we can't squander it. We can't squander it in what will be one or two generations. Um, I just encourage everybody to get out in nature as much as they can. Uh, you know, the city life can be pretty, uh, pretty tough. Um, it's very relaxing and very nurturing. So get out there and see it and do what you can to protect it. And, you know, we can all do something every day, um, obviously educating people about not consuming endangered species products. But anything we can do to reduce climate change is also going to help. Um, lowering our meat consumption is going to help. That's not just about climate change. It's also about habitat loss and just being more thoughtful about the impact that we have on the planet. So we can all do something. It's not too late, but the clock is ticking. We need to get on it now. I'm hopeful the younger generations can come up with a, a better, more sustainable way of living on Earth than we've done. Definitely. Thank you. With that, we say goodbye to you, Peter Knight from the Wild Africa Fund. Thank you so much for your time, for being on the program and for all the conservation work you do. And to our viewers, as always, it's been good to have your company. Thank you and stay connected.